Microsoft is one of the strangest companies in the world because they put out like three products that compete against themselves over and over and over. <coughs> They'll have two or three different products doing exactly the same thing. They had Hotmail, they had what, uh, Outlook Express on this thing, and they had Hotmail on the web, and they had another one too, all at the same time, because once there's a team doing something, they will not let go of it because they, they've got a carefully balanced bunch of power structures to survive. Anyway, so it's... Uh, what about Google? Google is, for a long time, Google was much more desirable um, because they never said no to anything. They just had money falling from the sky because Google had a really good idea. And they were like Microsoft was back in the monopoly. They just had infinite money. But then Google finally started cutting back a little, and some people are getting frustrated there. But um, the main thing about Google is you have to have a PhD. They basically don't even want anybody around that doesn't have a PhD, which is a lot more than most companies want. Um, but uh, most people think it's a very good place, although now people are saying, uh, some people leaving Google and going back to Microsoft. So um, there are some people having bad experiences at Google. For a long time, it was just wonderful. Now, Pixar is supposed to be great. Everybody loves it. It's like they work working in playground. Their products are incredibly good. I don't think Pixar has ever had a flop. They've made like 10 movies in a row, and every one of them is a huge hit, which is so they, and they're in Emeryville, right around here. I imagine it's hard to get in. I know Hurricane Electric is essentially impossible to get in. I had several students try to get in there. They give you two whole days of tests, and none of them could make it through the tests. What about Cisco? Cisco? Um, I think they've been cutting staff. But they're, they're, I mean, Cisco is unkillable. I mean, they're, they're huge. They're, they're the standard for large companies. A bunch of people use all Cisco stuff, even though it's very expensive. Um, so Juniper is the up and coming. Um, and some people have told me, I had students that worked at Cisco and Juniper and said they were both very good places to work. Uh, Juniper is the younger, more innovative company, but uh, Cisco set the standards of most of the stuff we're using. And they're also both around, also around here. A real good place for this stuff. And there's tons of startups, but nobody gets their first job at a startup. It's, you've got to have all rock stars at startups because you have like six people and they have to solve every problem. And so nobody can like have one job and one set of training. Everybody just has to do it all. Here, let's see what I got in the way of news. Um, I wonder, which is hilarious. I mean, because, well, it's entirely possible that it's more stable than their own currency because there's a lot of countries like that. Where, and it's also possible, and also it's Mugabe. Isn't he just one of these crazy sadistic lunatics? Yes. Yeah, so he's... Somebody talked him into doing it, and whatever he says just happens. But the funny thing to me is what it's going to do to Bitcoins, because the whole point about Bitcoin, all right, what is this nonsense? Okay, there. The whole point about Bitcoin was it would not be tied to a nation. So now it's tied to a nation. Ha, ha, ha. A nation What's that? Well, that's what I don't get either. I guess they're going to have to print you get Bitcoin bills and then there'll be counterfeits. I mean, yeah, how do you go to a, especially in a low-tech country, how do you walk into a store and pay for something? You're all supposed to have computers and smartphones to do a Bitcoin, Bitcoin transaction to buy anything. What do you going to buy fruit at the, you know, the... So this is like their only official I don't know. Because that would be very... I, I, I don't know. You mean what you could do is you could make it your standard. You could make your Zimbabwean dollar equal to 1% of a Bitcoin or something and tie it to Bitcoins. Um, but, uh, who knows? But the guy's one of these raving lunatics anyways. Hey, so Microsoft actually did turn on two-factor authentication. Apparently hasn't quite happened yet, but that's going to come, which is really good. I mean, many people are now moving to two-factor. Facebook has, Microsoft, and um, Google, and I think a couple other companies. So. This will make us all a lot better off. No more passwords. Or at least a stolen password won't be as important as it used to be. So Google Glass, you can't buy it. You have to approve, you have to apply for permission and get approved to buy it. Then you pay fifteen hundred dollars and then you can't loan it to anybody or sell it. And they know that because it's got to be tied to your Google account, and if it ever logs in with another account, they're going to deactivate it. So they're really ruthless about this, so I'm I don't know, but apparently people want it enough to put up with all that. Yeah? What does Google Glass mean? You wear this thing, it's like the Borg, you have another glass in front of one eye, and they're projecting stuff in one of that eye, so you got a heads-up live display. See, the, the, Sergey Brin, I think one of the two founders of Google, said about eight years ago that he wanted a brain implant, to have a Google brain implant. 
And this is about as close as you can get to it with current technology. But go on the internet with it? Yeah, go on the internet with it, search all the time. Voice recognition and face recognition is some of them. I'm not sure this one has some. They also had demos of ones that have a camera so you can look at somebody, it'll take a photograph of them, look them up, and their name and like oh. criminal history and stuff scrolls up inside next to them. So you're like Robocop, you know, all this stuff. <laughs> Yeah. And, um, oh, okay. Yeah. So I mean, it's 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 quite valuable. And soldiers have it, and guy people in cars have it with heads-up displays. I mean, it's coming, and it's enormously useful, of course. Although, yeah, the thing, one thing that's got people very worried about this, it does have a camera, and you can be videoing everything you do all through life. So there's one bar in Portland that already said they're not going to let you into this thing because it it basically is bad for the privacy of everybody around you. So there's some, that's the usual scary stuff that basically comes from antivirus companies and you never know how much they're lying. 90% of games are infected with malware. I, I think I heard, um, then I heard someone else say that usually this malware is key gens. Well, duh, <laughs> it's got key gens to make it run. So I don't know about that. Anyway, that seems a bit high to me. All I must say, I, I don't believe I ever pirated a game. So it's possible. And there's a similar one here from Microsoft that says if you don't run antivirus, you're six times more likely to be infected. Now that sounds much more plausible to me. That's the whole point of antivirus, I would hope. <laughs> I would hope it makes you less likely to be infected. And uh, PCs are on the way out. Here's a nice graph. This is the growth in PCs, 5% up in the first quarter of 2012, and then down, down, down. That's um, kind of weird because there's still something very, very satisfying about sitting down in a chair or whatever in front of a computer screen with a keyboard. Well, um, most people, I must say I'm the same with them. I have almost no use for these things on the ground. I want the portable ones. Do you never, do you sit? I got one in my office. No, no. I mean, but, but and three years ago, I did like 90% of my computing in that environment. Now I do 90% of my computing here. And I only use that thing occasionally. Because well, that's me with an iPad and a lazy boy, yeah. but I still yeah. find it very satisfying to sit down in front of the computer and just. But in the last year, I must have, I must, I spent a lot of money on portable devices, and I haven't bought one of them in five years, and I probably never will buy another one. I'll just keep the same old one forever because it's less and less important, and the portable ones are one. That's what they're all finding. They can't sell them. I mean, I can't see investing in those big heavy things unless you've got a server in a server room, or you've got a desk at like a reception area or something that's part of the company. But even them are mostly laptops now. It's, it's hard to understand, you know, everybody's got the same code. There's no real reason to buy those big heavy things for most computing anymore. Anyway, um, I thought this was pretty cool. Yeah, oh, I remember what this is. This is a, I've heard quite a few talks about this. So suppose you do go to the cloud. You virtualize your servers, so now your web server and everything are on Amazon. Then what do you do when you have an intrusion? A hacker gets into your stuff, or you have a subpoena. You have to find all the data about something. You need to make a forensic image of your cloud device. And there are special products just to do this. Now, Vream at uh, the last Pacific IT post was talking about how to back up your cloud device. And these guys are figuring out how to collect forensic images, and they're doing it from outside the virtual machine, the same way Vream does. They're copying the whole machine from the outside, and they can get your login credentials and suck it off any of the current cloud providers, Azure, HP, Rackspace, or Amazon, so you can get an image over the wire of your cloud machine for forensic analysis, which is pretty important. In fact, I kind of need to do this myself. I had an Amazon machine, and it was a honeypot, and it eventually got hacked, and Amazon sent me a message saying, your machine is attacking other machines. So I looked, and sure enough, it was, so I turned it off, and I haven't got around to it yet, but I'm planning to take an image of it and analyze it. So this, I need this product to get an image of the machine to find out how it got hacked. Uh, Ubuntu, I think. Oh, no, I, for, I think it was, I think it was Ubuntu. Yeah, it was not, it was Amazon, yeah, it, was, it was either Ubuntu or Amazon's default, which is Red Hat. I actually made it an RDP hunting pot trying to attack Windows attacks, and I thought that would be safe, but somebody eventually hacked it. So we sort of good to analyze it and find out what they did. And uh, good, I wanted to demonstrate something. Because I figured out how to do this yesterday, and it's awesome, and I'm going to be doing a bunch of this at the Pacific, at the um, Tech Days, which is coming up. But I figured out, see, this IP version 6 attack that I've been using that kills Windows machines, it also kills the Mac. So I've been unable to do it without having a Linux on hardware netbook to do the attack, and I finally realized 
if I use a USB NIC and I forward the USB to the virtual machine, then the virtual Linux can send traffic out that does not pass through the Mac. So it doesn't kill the Mac anymore. So now I can do an attack from a virtual machine on a Mac. But I can't do it through the virtual machine networking. So the virtual network adapter is disconnected. And it has to be, or I will kill the Mac before I can kill the target. This, what happens is this USB NIC right here is being detected in the virtual machine as ETH1. So I got um, Kali Linux here, which is the replacement to the backtrack you're using. And there's my ETH1. I got a crossover cable over to a PC here. And uh, let me do IP config and see if my PC is alive. I think it is. Yeah, it looks good. All right. So um, this is not going to be subtle if it works. So you really don't need a projector for that screen. But um, all right. I'm attacking this Windows 8 machine. And the attack is extremely simple. Let me stop this. OK. Now, uh, there are three things to do. And let me make this bigger to make it easier. Shift Control Plus. There we are. All right. Um, what I have to do is make an IPv6 network. And I'm going to use this thing called fake router. I'm going to advertise addresses starting with five. So when I do, it's going to send out one router advertisement per second, which is going to tell this machine that it's on a network with a router starting with five. And let me just do IP config here and make sure it saw it. Um, it did. Now this machine has addresses starting with five. Um, so that's, what you, that's how IP version 6 works. You send out these router advertisements, typically only one every five minutes. This one sends out one every second. And that tells everybody, join my network. So this machine joins the network. Now I'm going to send out another one, advertising network starting with six, just so there's two routers on the network, and it has to have two sets of addresses. After you do that, then you send a flood. And the flood, shift control plus there, is this one. Uh, that should do it. Yep. Now, at first, these dots are slow. It's doing some kind of handshake, and then after about 10 seconds, it usually speeds up. And it would be sort of nice if I could find out why. Each dot is 100 packets. There it goes. Once it's moving, we should see some action here within 20 seconds. Yep, there we go. It's dead. Blue screen of death. Yeah, yeah. That's, so that's, that's it. It kills Windows 8. And I believe from to I've been told it kills Windows 8 even when it's fully patched, but because of the OEM install, I can't get this thing to update at all. I spent all morning trying to update, and the updates sit zero percent as long as you leave it running. I think they're just going to have to leave it run overnight or something because this is a brand new machine and they filled it with garbage to break it. But anyway, then I want to get Server 2012 on there and kill there too, and that's what I'll show them at uh, because there's a whole bunch of Microsoft insiders at this conference. And I keep yelling at Microsoft about this stuff, and they keep ignoring me, so I want to keep slapping people in the face with it more and more, and more and more inside Microsoft. Because I yelled at them so much about Windows 7, they actually patched it. They patched Windows 7, they patched Server 2008. But they didn't patch Windows 8 and Server 2012. And I said, hey, come on, guys. You don't patch the new stuff? <laughs> because they don't think it's a problem. And the guy that wrote this tool doesn't think it's a problem either. This is because of Kirk. See, if you just run the flood alone, it doesn't kill it. You have to prime it with a couple of slow router advertisements first. And after that, it enters a vulnerable state. And I don't know why, but it's true. <laughs> if you don't use these two things first, then you can flood it all day, and it will not crash. Anyway, um, so Microsoft incorporated some kind of defense, but it wasn't a good enough defense. Anyway, so that's all I wanted to show you with that. And we'll carry on with cryptography, unless anybody had any questions or anything. All right. The first time I demonstrated that, we had to carry around two whole suitcases full of gear and special switches and routers and everything else to get it working. It's, I'm gradually learning how to make it easier. Anyway, um, all right, so uh, uh, encryption gives you confidentiality because it scrambles stuff. So you take plain text, which is text you can read, and you turn it into ciphertext, which is just random mixed up letters that you can't read. And the, they are not completely random. There is some way to turn them back into the original text if you have the key and you know the algorithm. And therefore, that is the difficult job. You have to somehow have an algorithm and key that cannot be broken by other people, but can only be used by the person 
who has the key, the authorized user. But that's the plan. Symmetric encryption uses one key, and you give the key to the recipient. Asymmetric encryption uses two keys, one you keep secret and one you publish. And both parties have to make their own private keys, and neither of you ever has to send any secret to the other person. So here's symmetric cryptography. This is the simplest kind, been around for millennia. Julius Caesar used it. Um, you, have a, you have clear text, you scramble it with a key into unreadable stuff, and at the other end, they use the same key to turn the unreadable stuff back into readable stuff. Uh, the, the Caesar cipher, all he did was move everything forward three letters in the alphabet. And the, the key was three, and the, the cure is to move everything back three letters. Now this is what they put in the Captain Crunch decoder ring when I was a kid, you'd get it in a box of cereal. And, so, and now they put it in the Sunday newspaper and children do it for fun. But in an era when almost nobody could read at all, this was enough to scramble letters so, no, so the letters would not be read except by authorized people. Um, now you've got to do something a little bit better than that. Asymmetric algorithms, you have to make two keys. And the keys have a mathematical relationship, but it's one that cannot be reversed. So you have a private key that you never tell anybody. It's stored in your hard drive. You make a public key out of it, and you tell the whole world that. And if anybody wants to talk to you, they scramble it with the public key. They make this junk that nobody can read, including the sender can't read it. The only person on earth that can read it is the holder of the private key. That's how it works. So I can, like a funnel, I can open up the opportunity for the world to tell me something that no one will ever know but me. You can receive messages in complete security. The person at the other end has to also make their private public key, and then the two of you can talk to each other with complete security, at least as far as the math goes. Now, if you ever see any security product that claims that it is perfect or 100% successful, then you are dealing with a liar or a fool. I tried to explain this to a hard drive company. Hard drive company um, contacted me about a couple of weeks ago, and they said, because um, I'm doing some work on data evaporation for SSDs, and they said, uh, we have discovered at our company that when you put the secure erase command on the drives, they fail frequently. You have to go back to the other pass. You're a data destruction company. It's kind of funny. That's all they do is destroy data. You pay them money, and they will erase your drives and then grind them up, and you really know they're gone. So they run the official erase command, then they check to see it really erased, and they say, that frequently fails. They said, but our process is 100% reliable. And I said, well, all you're convincing me is that you're stupid. There is nothing ever 100% reliable. If you did it a 1,000 times, and you prove that all 1,000 of those came out true, that does not prove you're 100% reliable in the future. That restricts you down to like a 99% probability that you'll get it right or something, but no amount of measurements ever prove anything to 100%. Anyway, just want to mention that. Anybody ever claims to be perfectly secure, they are lying to you. Uh, they have to have a more careful statement. And the problem here is, the math is essentially unbreakable by all modern techniques, but how do you know you got the right public key? The keys have to actually be handled and labeled, and that can be wrong. Anyway, we'll talk about more about that later. But that's the game. Asymmetric cryptography lets everybody receive messages with complete security, as far as the mathematics goes. So you take your clear text, you scramble it with the public key, and to open it, you need the private key, which you never told anybody. This is the point. If you have a secret and you never tell anybody, that's a sustainable system. If you have a secret and you have to tell somebody else the secret, this is not going to work. This is obviously... It's contradictory to have a secret and tell somebody. Now you don't know how many people know it. <laughs> and so the private key encryption suffers from a fundamental logical flaw. You have to keep the key secret, and you also have to distribute it. And this is how you get insanity, like the British Navy. The British Navy had this pattern of flags that would be orders in combat, and there was this book, which was their secret code book, and everybody in the Navy had to have that book. And the book had a bar of lead in the binder, and the captain of the ship was under orders that if the ship gets taken, you have to throw that book overboard. And if you fail to throw that book overboard and you get taken prisoner, we will bail you out to take you back to Britain and hang you. Because that book is worth more than your life. And this is the problem with secret keys. You have to give a bunch of people a key and then they have to guard it with their life. It's kind of stupid. It's all they had, but public key encryption completely re saves you from this. You, nobody has to have secrets like that. I don't have anybody else's private key. All I got is my own and I never tell that to anybody, and that's something you can do. But telling it to other people and then having it stay secret is inherently unsustainable. Anyway, so the algorithm is the mathematical steps you go through, and the key is the number that's used in the algorithm to scramble it. Um, so symmetric encryption, when I first learned about asymmetric encryption, I said, this is so beautiful, why do you ever use anything else? 
And the reason is it's much more complicated mathematically, like 10 times more complicated. So it's much, the keys are much longer, they're 10 times longer, the math is much harder. So you don't want to encrypt everything with asymmetric encryption or it will all be very slow. So to save money and time, he used symmetric encryption. And um, that's why another thing that really confused me when I first started learning this stuff is I saw wildly different numbers for how long your key should be. Private key encryption, 128 bits is enough. Nobody will ever get in there. Public key encryption has to be 10 times longer. We used to be used to 124 bit keys, and now the official recommendation as of a year or two ago is to use 2048 bit keys for public keys. They need to be 10 times longer than private keys, um, or they're not secure. And the fundamental reason for that is that the public key encryption uses only prime numbers, and the private key encryption uses all the numbers, and there aren't that many prime numbers. So you need a much larger key space to have as many keys to guess through. That's also why the math is more complicated. So I got a few I think, questions about that stuff. Come grab one if you need one. All right, so. Right, Alice wants to send a message to Bob with symmetric encryption. How many keys does she need? All right, one. There's one key, and you both use the same key. That's old-fashioned, simple, simple secrecy. No complication at all. And if you want to have a third person in the loop, you've got to give the third person the key. All right. Now she wants to use asymmetric encryption to send a message to Bob. All right. Um, yeah. I guess from my point of view, the switches are correct over there. What's that? B and D, because Bob must make two keys on private and on public. Yes. And he must send to Elise. So. No, no, no. No, no, he doesn't. No, no, you publish your public key to the whole world. It's not sent directed to anybody. Because you don't have any secure channels you trust. So we, uh, this is what we're talking about, though, because the correct answer is D. And it's an extremely unpopular answer. So let's talk about this. If you want, if any, it doesn't matter who's talking. If anybody wants to talk to Bob, you have to use Bob's public key. And the whole world uses Bob's public key, and then he's the only one that can read it because Bob's private key. It doesn't matter who is sending the message. If you, if you make a private public key pair, you have now made it possible that you, for you to receive secret messages. That's all. You can't send any secret messages with this technique. <coughs> Nobody can ever send any secret messages. They can only receive them, so your recipient has to prepare for it. This is why people don't use this for email. You can only use this for email if the people you're sending messages to are prepared. And that is always a drag. So there's a very small elite in the security community that are proud of themselves that they use PGP encryption, and only the most technically advanced people can figure out how to do this and they communicate with each other. If you want to communicate with normals, you can't send encrypted email because normal people can't figure out how to make the public-private key thing work. So it's kind of an exclusive club, which is not much use, and that's why we're still using plain text email. Almost nobody's encrypting email because it's too hard to set up. But anyway, that's, yeah? The homework about Cypher thing, uh, is it about this? Uh, in Cypher it? No, in Cypher it is private key encryption. There's a password, and you have to tell the other person the password. That's why it's so simple. This is hard to use. I had various homework assignments about it, and it is a drag. Even, all the, even the best software you can get really doesn't work. It, this has never really made it up to prime time for email. Yeah? Why are the phones more secure? Phones use 64-bit um, private keys. And I don't know how they distribute them. But it's not public key encryption. And um, HTTPS is plenty secure because the certificate structure we'll get to. It's actually 2048-bit or 1024-bit public key encryption. So those are pretty, all pretty good. But phones, phones, everything you do is constantly encrypted. It's a shame that email doesn't work that way. But we've just developed a huge email infrastructure without considering it, and it would require a considerable upgrade. And nobody feels like bothering. Anyway, you've got a couple more of these. Uh, if I can figure out how to make my slide go forward. There. All right. Now she wants to make two-way encryption with her and Bob using asymmetric encryption. Let's see? Oh, good. We're getting there. Four is what you need. Both people have to make private keys so they can receive mail, 
and both people have to make public keys so others can send them mail. So you need four keys. Alice is private and public, and Bob's private and public, and now they can talk to each other. How long should this key be that she's using? All right, and again, it's E. Good, go to popular answer. Keys have to be 2048 bits. That is the current recommendation for public key encryption. That changed a couple years ago. But all this stuff is pathetic. And in fact, a 768-bit private key was cracked about a year ago, a public key, 768-bit public key. That's why they decided to knock off 1024, because 768 is getting pretty close. So um, right here, private key encryption, even 72 bits has never been broken by brute force, I think. So 128 is considered re quite reasonably safe. And only your really extreme lunatics use 256. You can, but 128 is enough that there's enormously good reason to think nobody's ever getting in there without the key. So, uh, symmetric encryption. There are various techniques. One simple categorization of, of encryption schemes is how they work in terms of how much data they encrypt at a time. Most of them, once you see out there, are block ciphers, usually a block of 64 bits, so about 8 bytes. You take a block of data and you encrypt it. Another you know, block of data and you encrypt it. That's one way to do it. You can also have a stream cipher where you, the encryption process produces a, a pseudo-random series of ones and zeros in your exclusive OR bit by bit. This is what WEP uses, RC4. So you just encrypt it every bit, one bit at a time, and you have a stream of data going by. There's no reason why one is better than the other. Either one can be perfectly secure as long as the algorithm is good and the key is long enough. But block ciphers are more common. Um, so this, I hope it, you're getting the idea. It's just like your door key. You have one lock in your door. You have various people that are allowed to get in there. They all have keys, and therefore they can all copy the keys. So you don't really know who's going in the door. But if they don't make any unauthorized copies and they don't lose their keys, then you have control who can go through that door but they all have identical keys. So that's an issue. It has quite a few consequences. Um, but it is enormously handy to have this kind of security available. Um, but you can already see there's an issue. Like if somebody goes through the door and steals something, you don't know who did it because several people have the key. And there is nothing to distinguish one person opening the door from another person opening the door. So why things like a mag stripe are better. Everybody has a mag stripe card, but they're different, and it keeps a log. So if something bad happens, you know which one of them opened that door. Anyway, so AES is the most common um, cipher used by, well, I should, maybe I shouldn't say that. The most common one is usually the old stupid stuff that doesn't work. But this is the one everyone should be using. That's why it's there. It's certified by the government, National Institute of Standard, as the Advanced Encryption Standard. This is the, not, the original designer gave it another name, and then many ciphers competed to give the award of being declared the Advanced Encryption Standard by the government as the one recommended for everybody to use. And there are various sizes, 128, 196, and 256. They're all perfectly fine. Nobody's ever found any way to break into 128 or any of the others um, without the key. And it's, it's uh, fast. It's designed carefully to be very fast to compute, even on small devices, and strong. So nobody can get in without the key. That's the constraints of the competition. And there's a fun animation, which I ought to take a look at, 10P, if you haven't seen this. This is good fun. Um, this is what almost everything with good security is using these days. And so here's how it works. And I think it's very nice to see it this way because you can see how it accomplishes the goal of encryption. Now the goal of encryption is to, just like making hash out of food, you're trying to take all the patterns in the original message away. You're trying to scramble it so nobody can read the ciphertext. So, this should go forward. There we are. So this is Rinjail is the actual name the original developer gave it. And then after years of competition, it won and became the AES. So you got plain text coming in here. you got a key coming in here. You run it through this engine, and out comes ciphertext. And this stuff should have no patterns at all. Even if this stuff has a lot of repeating patterns, like it's network traffic, so it's got a bunch of ARPs and a bunch of IP addresses to keep coming around, this should just be totally random. You shouldn't be able to see any of the patterns here that are in there. So what you do, there's a temporary table kept called the state table. Here's the key. This is all hexadecimal, which we talked about before, four bits, uh, two groups of four bits turn into two digits of hex. So this is a byte. Each one of these two-digit quantities is a byte. So this is 16 bytes, four by four. Um, so let me get this thing to move forward. There. All right. So. 
Here's the process. You have a state table. You add a round key, but from the cipher key. Then you subtract bytes, shift rows, mix columns, and add a round key, and you do this nine times. And then you have one more cycle where you skip one of these steps, and that's it. Obviously designed to be quickly done in digital processors and easily programmed with repetitive steps. So that's the game. All right. And here's the four things you do every time. Um, you subtract the bytes. You run it through this S box. So this box is just a lookup table. From 0 to F and from 0 to F, you're going to take each of these numbers that's 0 to F and look up the first one here and the second one there and look up what it transforms to here. So this just transforms them in a deterministic way. So 119 turns into row 1, column 9, so it turns into D4. You just look up the table here to transform all those numbers. Then you shift the rows because there might be patterns vertically. So to get rid of them, you shift it over like this to scramble up the patterns. So there aren't any stripes vertically in case there were patterns in your vertical lines. Then you want to break the horizontal patterns, so you do the same thing this way. Now you do this with a matrix multiplication which mixes these values together, but it's similar to the other operation. It just breaks up patterns horizontally. So it scrambles these things. Then you add a key, a round key, which is calculated. Just add those numbers together. So 4 plus A is A4. 6 plus F is 9C, and on you go. Those are the four steps. Then, and these are all just simple bitwise. You do that nine times, and the last time, you skip one step. And that's it. Then you created 16 bytes, as long as the original 16 bytes, but no pattern is left in it. And you can reverse it all at the other end if you know the key. Yeah? The S box that you yeah. is it predefined or is it randomly generated? No, it can't, nothing can be random at all. It's got to come from the key. Because if there's anything random, you couldn't undo it at the other end. Yeah? Okay. If there's a no input, like 0, 0, 0, 0, can you detect a pattern of the cipher uh, If there's no, you can encrypt with a key of zeros, and you can encrypt a message that's all zeros, so and both of them could. figure out the key, I'm not sure. I yes. Yes, see, you're, you're, what you're into here is the chosen plain text attack. Yes, and you are quite correct. If you want to crack cryptography with a black box approach, you can often do it by carefully feeding in nasty plain text, like a key of all zeros or a message of all zeros, then a key of all ones, a message of all ones. You might imagine that would give you clues, and a key with just one one and all the rest zero moving it around. There are ways to do that. This one is very resistant to all those attacks. But um, well, cipher block chaining, which is one way to implement this, in fact is weak. They call it a padding oracle attack, and you can in fact pump the key out. That's how the beast attack works. There's a series of padding oracle attacks. The problem is you have a block of 8 bytes. So what if your message is 15 bytes? You take 8, next time there's only 7 more bytes. So what do you do? Most implementations pad it with zeros. So if you carefully choose something that is 9 bytes, you'll get an encryption that only has one byte of data and all the rest is zero. And there are only 256 possible values of that. So you can crack it by brute force. So if you can carefully arrange the length of your message and the implementation chose to pad it with zeros, you can pump out the key. There's, that's why there's always problems. The math is beautiful, but when you actually implement it in hardware, you have to make assumptions, and that's where the problems come in. That's probably where MD5 No, they, the M, no, see, MD5 is fundamentally broken. Even if there's nothing wrong with the hardware and everything, the math itself isn't good enough. It was supposed to be good. It was supposed to take 2 to the 80 guesses to find a collision, but it actually takes only like 2 to the 50. And WEP had 128-bit private key, so it should have been perfectly secure, but there's a way to get it without trying all the keys. So that's when, when your math is broken. Using four, four bits no, four, using no, no, four based, bytes no, no, no. No, nothing like that. It's um, there are patterns in it. It isn't it's good enough. It, yeah, there are patterns in the output you can use. That's the problem. It doesn't really scramble it well enough. And as you can see, that's the goal here: is cut it this way, cut it this way, mix it this way, mix it that way. So hopefully, there's no observable patterns in the output. And it's always an approximation, because at any point, some clown could think of some brilliant math and break this. This is just the best anybody can do right now with mathematicians. Um, anyway, so. 
And this is what happens to things in the past. Now, the data encryption standard is the kind of stuff that gives your um, protesters and conspiracy theorists a lot of fodder because it's kind of obvious that the government deliberately broke it. They, had a, they wanted to define the data encryption standard long ago, and IBM proposed a 128-bit private key system. And the um, National Institute for Standards reduced it to 56 bits and approved it, which was a very strange decision. And what everybody said at the time, the sort of hippies and protesters said they're doing this so they can read it, and I think it's become absolutely clear that was 100% true. The NA, with past enough computers, the NSA could read that stuff at 56. And so that's the problem. You can just break in if you can try two to the 56 keys. And that was pretty hard in the 70s and 80s, but by the 90s, that could be done. In 1988, they thought it was at risk. In 1997, there was the first brute force attack on this. I got the book of it. It's good, very interesting to read. They got 10,000 server administrators, donated their campus's Unix servers for three months over the internet. They had a master program that would break the private key into little chunks and pass everybody a chunk of keys to crack and then collect the data later through a very, very early internet transactions. After three months, they managed to crack a 56-bit key by brute force. The next year, the EFF in San Francisco made a special computer just for this purpose. They made these special chips called Deep Crack, which are designed only to do this one calculation, DES, and they made boards full of hundreds of these chips, and hundreds of those boards they had a giant computer that cost like $10,000 to do nothing but many, many of these, and that thing could crack it in like 24 hours. It could do all possible keys in something like 24 hours, and at that point, you have to quit encrypting stuff this way. Obviously, it's not a secret anymore. Somebody could just run it through this machine <laughs> and crack it. Um, that's when you've embarrassed them and say, and everybody was really, really mad that the government told us we should use this, and people built it into all their financial devices, and they said, it's totally not safe. And what's wrong with you anyway? And what I've been told from people, I don't think I've ever seen this written down anywhere, is the reason the government finally relented is because European banks said they were not going to do any more business with American banks if we use this garbage, because we're not protecting their customers' data. And so they had to come up with another one, and that was AES. So, what's that? That's where DES comes in? Yeah, well, well this DES, DES was proven to be insecure. By direct proof, they just broke ES without knowing the key in the simplest possible way. They tried every possible key. Now, there's no way you could survive after that. There's no, so they had to have some kind of improvement. Now, the problem is there's a bunch of devices now and software and hardware in stores and banks and everywhere using DES. So the first step to improve it is to invent something that is backward compatible, and that's triple DES. Triple DES is where you run three DES encryptions. Now, the most logical way to do it would be to have three different keys. But if you did that, it wouldn't be backwards compatible. So the way they actually did it is you encrypt with one key, decrypt with another key, and then encrypt with this key again. And anyway, that has the result that you can set it up. If you feed in the same key three times, you have single desk. So your triple desk machines can easily be set to run in single desk mode for backward compatibility. Or they can run in the more secure mode and have 112 bits a key, which is long enough. So this is what you always go for, and you just like it is always in all Microsoft operating systems everywhere. There's this modern secure technique, and there's also an option to go down to the less secure old technique in case you have old equipment and you want to keep interoperating with your old equipment. Anyway, now that's triple desk. Triple desk it takes a is slower to compute, but it's perfectly fine. It's depending on what mode you use, it's either 112 bits or maybe even longer key, and that's long enough that nobody's getting in there without the key. RC4 is what WEP used. Um, RC4 has gotten quite a few recent attacks, too. Um, but it was not the reason why WEP was broken, that they used RC4. Um, it was other problems in wired equivalent privacy. But there are a lot of a series of modern attacks on RC4 to where people are beginning to say we should quit using it. But it is built into a lot of products, including SSL. So if we really want to get rid of RC4, it's going to require quite an upgrade of many things. It's worth mentioning here, I said nothing's ever perfectly secure, but this is one that's perfectly secure as far as anybody can tell. It's been known for centuries, the one-time pad. As far as anybody knows, this is completely safe because you never reuse any part of the key at all, and the key is not produced by mathematics at all. So there are no patterns in the key. You do something like roll dice to make random numbers, and you just make lots of them, like pages and pages of them, and the message has to be smaller than the key. And so you, the original thing, you have typewritten letters, you'd have a page, you'd like add this letter, if you had A, you add one to it, a B, you add two to it. You, you, so you take the original key, you're on page 47, the other person has to have a copy of the book. It's private key encryption. They have to have a copy of the whole book, they use page 47, and they never use it again. Next time you send a message, you use page 48. 
and all the pages are completely random. This will work. There's no, you can analyze the mathematics of the cipher text all you want. There are no patterns in there. There is no way to extract the key. You never reuse any part of it. If there's patterns in the input, there are no patterns in the output. This is fine. The only way you can break into this is go steal the book. Now that's, there's always some way in, but the mathematical part of this is simple, and no one's ever thought of any way around it. I mean, there's no pattern in the key to break. There's no pattern in the ciphertext to break. You're, you're hosed. You don't want to break this with mathematics. Um, but you have to somehow exchange these private keys, and the private keys have to be really big, so it's almost never used in practice. You'd have to somehow synchronize megabytes of file first, and then send so much data, and then after you sent that, that amount of data, you'd have to stop until you come back in and get another refresh of the private key. This is pretty impractical. People prefer other systems that don't require such high maintenance. But if you did use that, you'd be completely secure unless somebody figures out how to steal the book. RSA tokens. Our example is this RSA token is what's used by all um, high security insurance companies and the military and everybody. They carry around this fob. This has a little tiny computer processor in there, and it has a number on there. And that number updates every 10 or 20 seconds, or some of them have a button where you press to see the next number. But the point is that number looks random, but there is some kind of pattern. And the server knows what the numbers are. So you log in, you type in your password, and then they say put in your number. You put in your number, and the server can tell if it's right or not. This number ought to just be random. It ought to just be a one-time pad, but it's not. And this all came out because um, RSA is greedy, and they wanted to continue to charge their customers. So they wanted a way to turn this off if you didn't pay your bill. So if I'm Lockheed Martin, and I put up a server, and I give my employees RSA tokens, in my, as far as I'm concerned, the RSA is out of the business, out of the picture. I should have my algorithm on my server and my algorithm and my keys, and they should not even know what it is. They shouldn't have nobody to get in. But in fact, RSA had the master key to get in all these things. I'm, now, I should say, this has never been publicly admitted. RSA, RSA got hacked in order to get into Lockheed Martin and other defense contractors. RSA got hacked, and the probably the Chinese, somebody got in there and stole the master key, and after that they attacked U.S. military bases based on the information they got from RSA. And RSA refused to tell anybody what happened, except for their closest partners, and they signed confidentiality agreements to never tell anybody else. So the, uh, there has never been an official explanation of exactly what they had and exactly what was stolen. So I'm just deducing based on logic. There should have never been anything at RSA that would ever weaken their customers. Their customers should have had a, a private key they typed in on the server, and they typed and they synchronized their keys with it, and RSA is now out of the picture. But apparently that's not the case. There was some kind of, some portion of this process actually went through RSA's server, and there's a secret on there that mattered. Yeah? So did someone at RSA tell China that we have a master key? Yes, somebody, it was presumably China, a nation state actor put advanced persistent threat in RSA, they sent them an email, so I got somebody to click on an attachment put a Trojan on their machine, wandered around their network and stole everything, and eventually stole something having to do with these tokens, which they used to break into US military uh, contractors that were secured by those tokens. And then there was an official statement saying they caught them before they got in too far and they failed. But that's what they would say also if they succeeded. Yeah. Was it uh, someone that by fault uh, clicked on an email, or was it someone that had knowledge that they were keeping the master key that uh, their official statement was that it was just an employee making a mistake. You know, they sent an email that looked pretty good. It was spear phishing. It said, uh, here's the payroll or something, and somebody clicked on it, got infected through a spreadsheet or something. And once they were in, they were nation state actors, probably Chinese, so they were good enough to not be obvious, and sneak around and stay on the network and hop from machine to machine for months until they found the crown jewels. And there was something in the RSA network <laughs> that made it possible to compromise people who used their tokens, and RSA actually replaced the hardware for many of their customers. Customers who complain could get like either free or discounted some vast amounts of hardware. These things are not cheap. These things cost a lot of money each. Um, and RSA replaced a ton of them. Now, I must say, in the modern world, to do it like Google, I got two factor authentication. There's an app on my phone. I really don't know how it works. It ought to just be something that has a private key that Google sent once to my phone for everybody. There shouldn't be some third party like RSA in the loop, but I don't really know. Yeah? Why didn't the government just develop a similar solution instead of hiring RSA? It's a, well, you know, because um, if you do the CISSP class, you'll see if you want to make anything for the military, there is the orange book. There's official rules of the security of anything you buy. This is why a hammer costs 900 bucks in the Army, because you have to, um, it's not enough to just make something. 
you have to prove that it's secure and you have to prove that it's continuously secure. So you have to prove that your company has security policies and review and control of all these things and it all has to have paperwork and auditable trail to prove that your company has a whole series of inspections at all different levels. And so it's a huge deal to do that. So there's only a few people that meet that requirement and RSA is one of them. So um, if you wanted to consider getting it from, say, Google, then Google would have to earn that certification, which is uh, ISO 27001 certification, essentially. And that is a process that takes four years and costs a million dollars to do. Very few companies will bother. This is why almost all military stuff comes from like one of ten contractors, because the requirements to get them to trust you are very high. And there's only a small number of people that go through this. So you have to have a huge auditable paper trail showing that you're watching at every step in your process, because you could make it, but then how could they be sure that you didn't get hacked by the Chinese, your people didn't get bribed by the Chinese, you just some, somehow sabotaged? And that's, that's in the basic structure as far as I know it. Anyway, so um, that's the game there. Those are the RSA keys. Um, they're still in use. And supposedly RSA fixed whatever went wrong, but they never told any of us what went wrong or how they fixed it because they keep it all secret. But they presumably told their big customers like the military. And they were apparently satisfied and continued to use them. Um, this is a big deal, by the way. Microsoft is sold to, um, there's a much less standard of security required for, I think, FERPA, um, where you require to sell to the civilian arm of government. And Microsoft passed it for Microsoft Office. And uh, I think it was somewhere in Southern California, a government wanted to switch to um, Google documents instead of Microsoft Office and Google claimed to have the credential to make it legal for government to use them when they didn't. And Microsoft took them to court and said, you cannot bid, you cannot win, you have not met the requirements uh, to sell to the government. It is quite a painful thing to please the government with what you do. Like say, we could get a ton of military money for these classes right here. If I would give up teaching and spend full time going to Washington and filling out forms, we could get approved as a cyber center of excellence and become eligible for grants. But it, that's what it takes. One teacher who knows everything about security classes has to spend their entire life filling out forms to satisfy them. How about that? Um, OK, I understand that's the same, but let's say 10 years ago, Microsoft software wasn't that secure. And there is that's, that's, of course, the problem. Just the problem is the system is kind of defective. Even though you go through all the hoops and fill out all the paper, it doesn't really make you safe. And, of course, now we're discovering there is nothing you can do that makes you safe. There's nothing that will stop the U.S. military from getting in your system. And there's nothing that will stop the Chinese from getting in your system or the Israelis or the uh, Iranians. All of them can blast right through all your security. So the, none of us have any clothes, and it's becoming clear. I mean, we imagined we were safe because we weren't being attacked by people that were serious. And when you get, start getting attacked by somebody serious, you find out it's really hard to stop cyber attacks. Anyway, so Blowfish is another cipher. Uh, Bruce, this is Bruce Schneier. He's the head of security at British Telecom and a uh, world-famous cryptographer, probably the most famous cryptographer uh, in active. Uh, you hear more from, uh, about him from anybody else these days. He's all the conferences. He's very good at using the media. And he's a good cryptographer, too. He found several problems in major Microsoft systems and made them fix it. Yeah? Um, back to the um, RSA. RSA, yeah. Um, how did you find out that this thing happened? Oh, it hit all the headlines. The RSA, well, first, RSA got hacked, and they had to admit it. But they wouldn't tell you what happened. They got hacked, and rumors came out. Then an official statement from RSA came out saying there was a compromise, and more details will come out later. And then weeks passed, and then a very careful statement came out with telling you essentially nothing except shut up and go away. And, uh, but they had to admit that they got hacked. They couldn't hide it. And after that, two months later, there was an attack, I think, on Lockheed Martin and another contractor, military contractors, going through their RSA tokens. So it all came out, at least the fact that it happened. But what exactly happened technically never came out. Oh, so uh, there are people that really know at RSA, and there are people that really know inside military contractors, but they all have signed confidentiality agreements to never tell us. Because a large, the military very much believes in security through obscurity. They like their system to be secret. In addition to being mathematically secure, they also say it's classified. Nobody can even know how it works. So inside this little world, the secrets are not supposed to come out. One thing amazing about all this is the Chinese have not hidden their traces at all. The Chinese are just blatant. They've been hacking us right and left, and they've been doing right from their main IP addresses, leaving obvious marks of who they are. They seem to want us to know it's them, or they just didn't think we were going to be smart enough to look. But anyway, so what's the most secure technique on this list? 
So the most secure thing is the one-time pad. That would be completely unbreakable except for stealing a copy of the pad. It's the only way, no way by analyzing the mathematical patterns. All right, uh, which is recommended by the National Institute of Standards for confidential data now. Well, <laughs> uh, of course, uh, well, I'll quit here at 25. And then that's um, what they've recommended is AES. Of course, there's a lot of systems still out there using DES and triple DES. The really old stuff is using DES, and it's a sin and a shame. There are people still using WEP. There's people using stuff that is absolutely known to be broken. The sleazy guys. There's people with no encryption at all, you know. Most people should at least be up to triple DES, and they should be moving towards AES. It's the best. But, um, you know, there's, there are people taking credit cards and throwing them around over WEP, and there are taxi cabs that read your credit card number over CB radios in plain text to get charged at the other end, which is just screaming to the whole world. It's bloody insane. There's a lot of stupid stuff out there, but most people have now moved up to AES because it's been several years since AES became commonly available. So unless your equipment is really old, it's pretty much using AES these days. But a lot of banks continue to use stuff that is very, very old because they care about reliability than anything. They don't replace every couple of years just because the stuff has a new version. They stick with the old thing for a long, long, long time because they trust it. All right, let's try simplest and oldest. All right. All right, and of course, again, that's the one-time pad. You do not even need a computer. Ah, I thought more people would get it right. The one-time pad's been around for centuries. You don't need a computer. You don't need a typewriter. You can do it with your hands. You can just roll dice to make the numbers, and then you move every letter forward a certain number. I mean, this is, this is real low-tech and yet perfect. It's just a lot of work. It's a lot of work, but if you want to scramble stuff, we've known techniques for centuries that will totally scramble it. It's just inconvenient. All right, the 56-bit key, which one has that delightful property? All right, and that's DES. The Data Encryption Standard is what it stands for, and it's a bloody shame like wired equivalent privacy. These are lies. Both of them are lies. They tell you it's safe, and they aren't safe. 